In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I, I want to say I love today's scripture. It is often taken out of context a bit when only verse 11 is read. That's why we read a, a little bit more today. God was telling the people of Israel that he will be with them always. It always means just that, always. There will be hard times, there will be good times. But God has a plan for each of us in both and in everything in between. God will be with each of us. Man, I'm happy to be home. We bounced through eight different time zones and more miles than I can even imagine. But we did travel every darn one of them. <laughs> Have you ever found that your faith is a little different when you're far, far away from home? I know that I love my routine. And when my routine is interrupted... It seems to prompt me to cling to God for some sense of normal. I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. That was a portion of what Kathy just read. Now I grant you, we, we were not in exile, but we were far from home and clinging to the peace of Christ. Well, it really helped, especially at those times of really tired or really upset stomach or other things that were just kind of hard to put up with. I want to share three stories from our time away. We visited a whole bunch of churches. One that stands out to me was in Nazareth. It's called the Church of the Annunciation. This is a church that is built over the home of Mary and believed to be the site where the angel appeared to Mary and told her that she would bear a child from the Holy Spirit. That, that is the Annunciation. It's a beautiful church. We've got a lot of pictures to share as soon as Kathy gets them organized, and she's working on that. She was the photojournalist for this trip, and is working on putting together a program just for our church family and anyone that you would like to invite. Um, you do a lot of walking in Israel. It's really hilly. You... Um, either are going up one hill or down the other just about all the time. The roads and the sidewalks are bumpy and it can be really tiring. There is also nowhere to park a bus anywhere close to a significant historical site. So you walk a whole bunch. <laughs> As we hiked up to the Annunciation Church, we were confronted by a baker. Now that's not an uncommon experience anywhere. We've all become a little bit numb to the beggars and street people that we meet in Austin and Dallas and Houston, Waco, even some places here in Temple. But this man was different. He was impossible, impossible to ignore. He had an absolutely gruesome exposed wound on one of his legs. Uh, I suspect that he was suffering from complications of diabetes, uh, nurses maybe, that, kind of makes sense, I think. Um, it was an injury that just wasn't healing. It was probably infected, and it was likely to get much, much worse. He didn't speak English, but his face and his wound screamed, I am in pain. I need help. There were 14 people in our group at that point, and each of those who, who saw him gave him a few shekels, Shekels is what the currency is called in Israel. Uh, right now, 3.1 shekels is about a dollar. The question I've been considering is this. Did God place that fellow in our path? Was he sent to remind us of our call to serve? Did we get to take time off from being a Christian when we're on vacation? I don't know why that man was there, but I do believe he was there for a reason. The proximity to where, where the whole Christian journey started, it really floored me. Some will say this fellow was just opportunistic. He knew that tourists would be flocking toward the church. And while that's true, I say to that, so what? We've been home for a week or more, a little over a week, I guess. And I can't seem to forget this man. I wonder if we could have or should have done more to help him. What I think God is telling me is that we each need to continue looking at all the ways that we can be the body of Christ, all the ways that we can help those who are in need, whether they are in Nazareth, 
or Temple, Texas? Do we have to give away everything? Now, in Matthew 19, Jesus told the wealthy man to sell all his possessions and give them to the poor. He didn't say, take the pocket change out of the bottom of your purse and pass it along. Give it all away. It's pretty clear. He promised that man that he would have treasures in heaven. The wealthy man went away in sorrow, the Bible says, because he had great wealth. Jesus reminded his disciples and all of us, it's hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I know it is pretty tough to consider giving it all away. For practical reasons, we really cannot. But we can fulfill the spirit of this story when we look at every hungry person we meet on the street as, first and foremost, our equal. And then we look at them as an angel placed there by God. So I, I'm going to pray that I will continue to be open, open my heart and my wallet to those in need. And I pray that we all will too. I, I believe you're a generous group, just by all the many things we do all year long. We can always find reasons to spend our money or to cling to our money. Money's getting tighter. I, I recognize that right now. But God's plan for each of us, I believe, is to continue to help those who just cannot help themselves anymore. Another memory I came home with is a man named Peter. Now, for Facebook buddies, you saw Peter's picture. It's not the Peter. It's another Peter. <laughs> This Peter was our guide as we visited the garden tomb of, Ju of Jesus in Jerusalem. Oh, let me explain briefly. There are two sites that are considered historically to possibly be the tomb where Jesus was laid. We don't know who's right and who's wrong, but I can tell you that both are very holy places. Peter's a volunteer working as a guide at the garden tomb. He's a retired engineer from England. He has a PhD from Cambridge. He's also blind. He and his wife moved to Israel to serve God in their retirement years. He served by example, just a loving heart and a dedication to the mission of telling people who came to the tomb, telling them about the love of Jesus. It was an incredibly moving experience. When he was introduced to the group, we all kind of looked around at each other like, is he blind? <laughs> but he won us over. He really did by simply just loving us in the Lord. He showed us pictures of the site through history, even though he can't see them. He walked us from one location to the next in the site. He even knew the name of the little kitty cat that was walking around with us. Peter shows us we can all serve God. We cannot let our frail nature, our infirmities or disabilities dictate how we love God and serve him. And then there's Steve. Steve is an associate pastor in the Baptist Church. He was from Florida. He was a member of our group. Steve is, I would guess, in his 40s, I'm not sure. Uh, he lost an arm to cancer as a young man. But Steve, too, has not let his illness control his life. He's married. He's, he's a brilliant preacher, though I must say I learned that Baptists like to preach much longer sermons than we Methodists do. <laughs> but rather than let his cancer and subsequent amputation ruin his life, it has made his life special. It has opened doors for ministry and testimony, and it's allowed him to serve God with great faith and great love. I hope I'm a better man for meeting these three men in Israel. These three men reminded me that God has amazing plans for each of us. We have all heard that before, but Steve and Peter and the diabetic beggar are all equal in the eyes of God. They are all seeking to find God. Our scripture today is from a message that God told the Hebrew people going into exile for 70 years. Though he wasn't going to end their exile early, all was not lost. He tells each of us today the same thing. All is not lost. We are never without hope. We are never without God when we choose to keep him at the very center of our life story. These three men remind me of that every day, and I hope and I pray you can take on part of that story too. Now, I made the first draft of this message on a sleepy Wednesday afternoon in Jerusalem. 
Since then, I've continued to think and pray about God's plan for my life. I view our two weeks away as kind of a sabbatical, really. That's partially influenced by the statement that a lot of Israeli residents make that their country is the fifth gospel. I am thankful to my wife, whose idea this trip was to begin with. I am thankful to all of you who supported our time away, and of course to Dr. Foster, who provided pulpit supply for two weeks. And I've got to mention also, I'm thankful for the folks at Baylor Scott and White who covered my duties there for two weeks. The two weeks were a tremendous physical challenge for me. The airplane flights were exhausting, especially the return trip. The food was different, the water was suspect in a couple of areas. I was pretty sick for about four days. While it was not COVID, I, I had a couple people worried, but prayers and Pepto-Bismol seemed to finally get me through it. And the spiritual and emotional challenge of seeing so much so fast is another element, as they say, that I'm still trying to process. Especially in Jerusalem, the places we read about in the Bible are relatively close together. The city was smaller 2,000 years ago, of course, and now the sites, or uh, likely sites, they're all covered, usually by a church. And the second time we entered in another church, it's called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, it's in the old city of Jerusalem, I felt as close to God as I think I ever have. That church is huge. It's built over one of the other sites that may have been Jesus' tomb. It's also built over Mount Calvary. Now that's a little hard to explain, but it, it's, it's perhaps 40 or, or 50 feet uh, in elevation higher than the tomb site. And again, it's now all surrounded by this enormous church. I would say seeing 2,000 year old olive trees in the Garden of Gethsemane may be the most concrete evidence of tying those times to today. The trees are still there. And to imagine being in the space where Jesus was arrested is, is a lot to think about. If you want to go to Israel, I would certainly encourage you to do so. But I think it's important to realize we don't need to go to Israel to experience Jesus Christ. Traveling there was a great blessing, and I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to go. But more important than that is the knowledge we have the same Holy Spirit present right here, right now. Jesus does not live in Jerusalem. He lives in the heart of every Christian who calls him Lord. So we've covered a lot today. I know we're running a little late. Up until a few days ago, I looked at the saints as being another word just for our loved ones who've passed on to heaven ahead of us. And that's true, and it's a big part of our candlelighting service. It's important to recall that my mom and my dad and all the persons that you have loved dearly in your life are part of that saintly choir now. But I want to stress that you, you are a saint too. Paul is quoted more than 15 times in the Bible calling the members of the church saints. Read the first part of 2 Corinthians or the first part of uh, Colossians and you'll see what I'm talking about. The members of the church today are saints too. As we work toward living a Christ-centered life, we are in the footsteps of other saints. Blind Philip, a sickly beggar in Nazareth, and Pastor Steve in Florida, and you, all of you. While we are among the saints, we are each also numbered as sinners in need of the love and salvation of Jesus Christ. We need to share that love with others as we grow in wisdom and faith. We need also to know that those saints whose witness we recall are the example that we need to model to our friends and family and neighbors. It's not about winning a seat on the last bus to heaven. We don't win our way to heaven, but we are called to live an active faith and share that faith every day. So as our scripture says today, when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. God's plan is for you to be with him in heaven. So keep praying, keep believing, keep loving your neighbor. Wherever you are called in life, know that God will never leave you. And even if you get on a plane and fly 7,000 miles, God will be there too. 
I guarantee it.